Hi, my name is Lise Colucci. I'm one of the life coaches at Queen Being. Today, I answer questions from survivors of narcissistic abuse. If that sounds good, hit subscribe and let's go. So the first question I have here is, I have a big topic I need addressed. A lot of male narcissists are interested in much, much younger women. They withhold love, sex, and affection from the woman they're with only to compare them to other women. They will compare their partners to younger women because they want to hurt and control their partner and also because the younger women seem easier to control. So my question is, can we as survivors know that there are good men out there who truly love women, women their own age? Does real love exist? And what is it like to be with a person who truly is passionate and not a fake passion of being a yo-yo with a narcissist? How can we as women know that we do have beauty at every age and we do have the balls and deserving to demand real, amazing, wonderful love from the people who are not disordered? How do we create that space of fearless, deserving, and compassionate love for ourselves when the abusers have taught us to search for crumbs? I'll start with the end and work back. When you are in a pattern of searching for crumbs, that is an addictive pattern because it releases dopamine in the brain every time you have the reward. Every time the crumbs are found, when you're sitting there in the emptiness, when there's no crumbs in front of you, every time you receive those crumbs, you have a surge of dopamine in your brain and that gives you the feeling of release. It gives you the feeling of receiving. It's kind of like playing slot machines. When every pull, every pull, every pull, there's nothing. And then when the coins start falling, it really doesn't matter how much money is coming out. It is super exciting. And you could get, you could spend $100 on slots and get $20 back and you're still excited while it's happening. It's the same thing. To break the addiction, you have to understand that it is one. You have to understand that your perception of what is affection from that experience has been distorted in your mind to equating it with love. You can get past that, number one, by understanding, but also it can take time to find new ways to, in a healthy way, fill the need that you're feeling for wanting love. Loving yourself, as we're working backwards, is the answer. So you already know the answer, and that is to find ways to love yourself. Self-care, self-observation, understanding where the gaps are in your beliefs. Where, where are you believing and what are you believing about yourself that you feel is unlovable and changing that. There's a million ways out there to change that. A few of them might be to affirm to find the things that you feel are not lovable about yourself or don't deserve love or aren't as good as somebody else, where you're comparing yourself, recreating the trauma inside your own head that you've experienced in your life and affirming a positive truth to change that belief. So if you believe I don't deserve love because I'm over a certain age, or you believe I'll never find love because I'm over a certain age, or I'm not good enough because I'm over a certain age and people don't like me because of that age, then you are solidifying in your own thought process. So you take that, you write it down, you keep it in your head, however works for you. You find a, a new belief to alter that false belief to. It is a false belief. People find love and affection and a partner at any age, it, it happens. So that right there tells you that is not, a, to, to create a new belief, you have to take the old belief and dismantle it. Dismantle it on paper, in your head, however it works, like I said, create a new belief. I'm too old and no one will like me because I'm this age. To anything you can believe, Anything that you can believe that is not self-limiting. I like to work my way incrementally with this. So maybe it's too hard to go. I am a wonderful woman of whatever age and I'm powerful and wise and beautiful. That Maybe that just feels too much to say. So instead you say something maybe like, I have worth and value and wisdom in my age and I am 
a lovable human being with my own beauty and my own unique personality. And I am my own unique person that people do find attractive, people do care about. Now, as you change that belief, as you change that thought process, it takes doing it over and over and over every time you catch yourself going into the negative belief. If we don't do this, it can be a trap. It can, be, it can keep you stuck in feeling the way you feel and then relying on other people to change that belief for you. And who are the ones who want to change that belief for you the most? Usually it's toxic abusers because they're the ones who gain from changing your belief into what they think will make you feel under their control. So that it goes back to how you can believe that there are good men out there. Not everyone's going to do that. Not everyone's going to want to control and abuse you. There are good men out there by proof that there are male survivors out there who are equally suffering. And the reason they stay with their partners is because they're good men. They are trying to make the most of the situation and they don't know what's happening to them. That's one proof that there are good men out there. That what you can focus on is how you feel about you. And as you do this, my guess would be you will start attracting people who also see this. And they see this in a way where they don't want to hurt you. They just want to know you. And they're just interested in you as you go out and meet people. It is. Um, you also learn how to spot narcissists by slowing down and keeping a check on yourself as you are around them. What are they making you feel? Again, what boundaries are, you, are they crossing? How do they treat people? How do they treat other people? I mean, you, you, you make sure you understand how to spot a narcissist and that a lot of that takes time. Stepping back and slowing down and not rushing into things. I hope that answered some of the questions that you had. And I like the way you asked it because you yourself piece the answers together through the way you ask the question. I have a longer question here, so I'm going to read part of it. How can I deal with my PTSD? Like at work, I feel overwhelmed, extremely anxious and panicked and not in control of my emotions, irritability, frustration with customers, so on. I have zero tolerance for people who are disrespectful. These things never used to affect me much. She goes on to say that she's having bad dreams about the narcissist as well. When you know you're dealing with PTSD, well, first of all, if it's to the point where it's affecting your life, you might wish to seek therapy. If you feel like coaching would help with that, that's an area where a coach can work more directly with you to help you answer some of your own questions about that. If that isn't an option for you or you are not wanting to do that or you don't feel that that's ne necessary, then understanding that when you have PTSD, when you have trauma, the stress from trauma fills up your cognitive function. I'm just going to read you a very short description of what cognitive function is. It is the intellectual activity that includes the mental process, such as attention, processing speed, learning, memory, and executive function, verbal fluency, and working memory. So if that is being filled, if that part of your brain is being filled from the trauma, it actually, it's a finite amount of space that you have in a day. So you wake up and you've got, say you have a cup, and that is your amount that you get for your cognitive function. If you wake up and you're already to the point where you're at the top of your cup because you are so stressed and, and ruminating about the trauma that you've had or you are deeply affected from the trauma that you've experienced and you're still in a state of heightened trauma, then you only have a little sliver of room left in your cup to function with. So of course you're getting frustrated and you're reacting to customers and you're, all of these things you describe are happening. So the key can be to lower the amount of stuff that's in your cup. Understanding it from that perspective can give you a little bit of space to be patient with yourself. This is totally normal for trauma to have limited cognitive function going on. And the way you get space there and you get more room with which to function from is things like I said before, therapy different types of modalities in therapy, bring your focus back down and let the trauma go. Now, doing it on your own or alongside therapy on your own, you can try things like meditation and to really give yourself a good couple weeks 
to a month of really putting attention and time aside for a practice of meditation. Finding some mindfulness meditations that are about 10 minutes long. If you can work yourself up to a half an hour one, that's great, but 10 minutes long a couple times a day, ideal for this type of acute trauma situation where you need to get some of that trauma out of you so that you have room to function with. So the way meditation helps is being present in the moment that you're in and allowing your thoughts with a mindfulness practice, allowing your thoughts to just be there, allowing the feelings to just be there without assigning meaning to them, without assigning judgment to them for 10 minutes only. You don't have to do it all day long. It's not like you got to hold on all day and not judge things, but just 10 minutes of breathing and allowing which what's going on within your head and your heart to just be there. At the same time, bringing in your environment, bringing in what you see, what you smell, um, sounds that you hear, and just breathing. And if you can do it with a guided meditation, even better, because then you have something to put your focus on. Do, doing that over time can help to restore some cognitive function, restore some space for cognitive function. You can do things like aerobic exercise. That's another one that will raise your dopamine, it'll raise your serotonin, and it will and it will help to increase your cognitive function because you are releasing through the chemicals that you're releasing in your brain when you exercise, like to the point of runner's high, you can help to achieve some good results. If that's not safe or sound for you, or you don't want to do that, there's other, other things you can try are body-wise are yoga, Pilates, I would say possibly even weightlifting, anything where you're using core muscles to ground yourself and really work on like a deep level in your body. By doing these things, it can be helpful to basically you walk into the yoga studio or your room, turn on the yoga video, wherever you're going to do your practice. Imagine yourself hanging up your problems at the door and focusing on that practice. It's only 20 minutes to an hour, however long you choose to do it. You can let it go for that long. You can pick it up on your way out. That's fine. But hang it up. Don't bring your problems to your practice. Let your practice be by what it is. It's hard enough without all the stuff in your head. And that may sound easier said than done, but it actually can work if you can visualize a coat hook or a box to put your problem in somewhere to just put it away while you're doing the exercises. Because it's getting space from the trauma, getting space inside yourself in your day, within your day, can help you not be so burned out. If you were running, like physically running, nonstop, without a break, you'd collapse. But that's what we do to ourselves with trauma is we run nonstop without a break. And so we have to force the break in sometimes. We have to take the break for ourselves. So anything that feels like it would be a break for you and you are able to put your focus on something positive for yourself can help you as well. If it's learning something new, if it's planning a vacation, if it's taking a vacation, if it's taking a walk, meeting new friends, meeting old friends, anything that can give you moments in your day where you can calm down and not be in the trauma. Again, my name is Elise Kalichi. I'm a life coach at Queen Being. For information about me, about coaching or group coaching, you can see the comments below. Hit subscribe and see you next time.